the the first guy underneath he didn't have enough grip on his shoes and he started slipping and i think the sound came from me was no 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 and uh and then the sound of a piano crashing like in a bugs bunny cartoon yeah is just it's the same yet more vivid when you hear it in real life Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and I am running my podcast today. It's going to include music. I am with a composer, uh, a musician that I regard very, very, very highly uh, in that I love his music, and I think he has a very unusual sound, so we're going to go into that. So In Conversation with Frank Schaefer is a podcast. It's on Facebook Live. It is on YouTube, various other websites and all that stuff. And today I'm with Mackenzie Stubert, who is a composer and a musician. He's an Emmy nominated and AMP winning composer based in Los Angeles. He has done interesting things when it came to the Emmy. Uh, It was for a virtual reality project for the New York Times, which then went on and won the Con festival lion grand prix and because i grew up in switzerland and i'm not being pretentious it doesn't trip off the tongue for me to say it all wrong in english it is the Cannes lion grand prix okay just in case you are french speakers out there um so mackenzie today i'm going to ask you if we can play some tracks off your uh, album called waiting room I have got a secret agenda here in that I want people who make movies to hire you because as a filmmaker who's made 35 hours of documentaries and then went on and made four rather forgettable Hollywood feature films, nevertheless, I know enough to know that when I listen to your music, it reminds me of listening to Vangelis before he did Chariots of Fire. I'm not talking about style, but where you just knew what this guy's doing will someday be a memorable score. And I know you have lots of other things besides scoring, but um, when we play this album for everybody, Cuts Off Waiting Room, I want them to be thinking about the fact that, hey, doesn't this all belong in a really first class movie? Isn't this the kind of music that you wish was scoring the sort of films you watch? So Mackenzie, Let me start just by asking you about yourself a little bit. We met through your wife, who is a producer writer, Tiffany, who involved me in a project that she was making, and I've already interviewed her with her co-producer, Paul, or her person she's making a movie about. She sat out on my porch between setups interviewing me, talked to me about you, and I kind of offhandedly said, oh, well, play me some of his music. About halfway through the first cut, listening on a cell phone, I I said, stop. I want to go Bluetooth on this, put it on a proper speaker and really listen. This is too good to be handled casually. And I still feel that way. So your music really touches me and I love it. I think you're brilliant. Um, Talk to me about Waiting Room a little bit, the album, your musical career. And then in a couple minutes, we're going to play a track, actually track one called Never I Know. And one thing I want you to mention while you're setting this up and we talk about the track is this unusual way you have of using sort of older instruments and sounds. Mm-hmm. So have at it. Explain, your, explain yourself to us a little bit and let, let folks get to know you as a musician and a composer and human being sure. and someone who, who has this loving attention to detail with old, strange sounding, beautiful, beaten up instruments. What's the deal with, with you, Mackenzie? Uh, let's see here. I grew up in Oregon, uh, started playing music at a pretty young age, was uh, fortunate to be of that last era of robust public school music programs before the troubles <laughs> of uh, defunding those those things. Yeah. And, and so I had a lot of opportunities to to be exposed to music and to play. And then just like everyone who who plays or doesn't play music, there are these like pivotal moments where you hear something and just, it resonates with you. And I think it's because you hear something of yourself in it or either some place you want to go or somebody that you might want to be. Mm -hmm. And you can't understand it because the language of of music kind of moves beyond 
the simplicity of, of, of verbal language. And, uh, and so I, I kept pursuing music. And then when I was about 10 or 11, um, I made the connection between film music and films and composers and directors. And I, I fell hard in love with mm. the world of film music. And then through the exploration of those composers, I discovered their favorite composers and the ones who inspired them. And it's been just kind of a lifelong pursuit of, of new sounds and uh, new emotional exploration. And then in the process of finding my own voice uh, as a composer and as a human, uh, in my travels of um, personal development and belief and getting over the ghosts of music school that can, um, you know, they can teach you how to do music, but then they can also kind of put you in a, a self-imposed uh, cage and you have to find your own way out. Um, and and so in the process of making this album, I, I finally found my way out of a self-imposed uh, waiting room, not to put too fine a point yeah. on it. So this is the waiting room. Let me ask you a question about waiting room and then we're gonna play it. Um, I know the album is done now, I believe. Um, yeah. If people want to hear this album, is it available somewhere or are you still it's pitching actually, it or what are you doing? It's actually due to come out uh, early 2022 on Curious Music, which is a okay. really wonderful label that has put out Harold Budd and Rodelius and some of my, my favorite composers of, of ambient music and electronic music. And, and so it's, it's scheduled to come out uh, in the winter and then by next summer, possibly very likely um, on LP. So we'll actually so have- is a there, what, How do we get our people linked to wherever they're gonna be able to get your album at some point? Cause there's folks probably, who's gonna wanna follow up. Yeah, probably just through, you know, my website, mackenziestubbert.com. Yeah, which we will link to and it'll yeah. be everywhere, everywhere that you hear this or see this, yeah. we will put all the links down so you can get to Mackenzie. Before we talk about anything more, let's let's listen to the full track of track one. I never know, never, never, sorry, I know. never, I know. Um, and then, you know, all I'll say to folks when they listen to it, please listen to the way he's using instruments in this far beyond anything you can hear. And also so organic and non fooled around with in the sense that this is you, you almost hear the instrument breathing. It's it's different than anything you've heard from a while. So, Ernie, if you will cue up Never I Know and I will shut up and let's just listen to some music here.
I love that piece of music. I mean, I just absolutely fell in love with it passionately. Campion, if you're listening to this somewhere, get in touch with Mackenzie and let him score your next movie. And the same goes for my pals at BBC, uh, you know, the programs you make, both radio and television. I mean, it's such a good fit with anybody who's making thoughtful or beautiful or sensitive things that are filled with empathy. I just cannot say enough about what you've done with this album. I want to talk about the sounds we're hearing. When I say I can almost hear the instruments breathe as opposed to all the electronic overdubbing and all the crap that you've got out there now with this overproduced nonsense in the pop world. What have you done? I mean, this piano is a person to me. Tell me the story of these instruments and what are you doing with them? Um, well, the piano in question is, is here. Yeah. And it's a 1947 acrosonic budget console piano that is in my possession only because um, a pair of piano movers in Portland dropped my other piano down the stairs. Uh, I'd finally was at the point when I was moving uh, into a studio space and I thought I can afford to not move this piano by myself with the help of strapping, you know, friends. Yeah, I paid some movers and uh, they, the, the first guy underneath, he didn't have enough grip on his shoes and he started slipping and I think the sound came from me was no 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 and uh and then the sound of a piano crashing like in a Bugs Bunny cartoon yeah is just it's the same yet more vivid when you hear it in real life so this was the loner piano that they gave me and the the man who was restoring my piano encouraged me to keep this he mm -hmm. said, they dropped your piano. They'd probably let you keep this one. It's a little bit nicer. And I said, okay. So I traveled down with me to uh, Southern California. The moving company accidentally shipped it to Little Rock, Arkansas first, and then it eventually made it to, to us. And um, I spent a few years with these pieces re-recording. Uh, I went to my friend Patrick's studio in Studio City and re-recorded everything on his beautiful baby grand piano. Mm -hmm. And I got home and, and my lovely uh, wife, creative partner said, you've, you've just destroyed your album by stripping out all of the humanity. Uh, Brian Eno is one of my, my favorite creative minds and he has these oblique strategies. And one of them, when you're stuck creatively, you, you just pull out one and you get a strategy and you follow it. And it says, take the most awkward part and make it a feature. Uh, it's why I eventually shaved my head yeah, it's a good point. And, and what I realized is that I was hiding, I was hiding the feature of, of this work mm -hmm. by, by trying to put it on a prettier sounding piano. So instead of turning down the creaks and the, the natural, um, pop, you know, quote unquote negative aspects of this piano, I actually just turned them up yeah. and, and I let the breathing and the aching be uh, a central part of the entire project. And so the, the first piece that it came out was called Respire that that I put out as a single a couple of years ago. And that was actually about turning 40 and feeling your body in every moment of the day and breathing and just, and sensing your body. And, and I wanted to kind of lean into that with, with music. Like, what would that feel like to, to feel the ache of the instruments? Yeah, what would it feel like to be the instrument? Because the thing is the, the point of view, if you can put it that way, is of a, of a, of a small creature inside the piano. I mean, you hear the works mm -hmm. of the piano like I say, I feel like I'm hearing the piano breathe now. Okay, so that's the piano. Now, the thing is, to me, the first time I heard this, I, I got tears in my eyes because um, I think, let me put it this way. I think the hardest thing to do in art, period, is unsentimental beauty that is not pretty, but is just heart-stoppingly beautiful to the point where you tear up when you hear it but not maudlin. And that's why I keep thinking that these tracks should be picked up by somebody making a film where they want to evoke that, where there's a seriousness and a beauty, but not a maudlin prettiness. And somehow, I don't know how to put this, but you have managed with this album. And I think as folks listen to more cuts today and then get the album, they're going to understand what I mean. You know, this music is not pretty, but it is stunningly and heart-stoppingly beautiful. It is not sentimental, but it seems to me to be full of pathos and emotion. And 
I don't know how well you understand that that's probably the hardest thing to accomplish in art. It's easy to make ugly. It's easy to make scary. It's easy to make pretty superficial. It's very hard to make non-sentimental beauty. And that's I would, just, I mean if I was be... writing a review, I would just say this album is non-sentimental beauty. You can, we'll put that, we'll put that on the jacket. Um, yeah. But isn't that kind of what it means to be human? I, I feel like there's something I'm thinking of that I love more than anything in the world. And there's a lot of ugly, you know, there's a yeah. lot, of, there's a lot of mess. Yeah. And, uh, and if we were to be really honest with ourselves, I think all of that is what is, what is in the genuine human experience and, mm -hmm. and the, the attempt of denying that, you know, yeah. the, the companies that would try to improve upon nature and pretend that sure. this experience could be somehow better if we removed the, the bits that hurt mm -hmm. um, is ultimately unsatisfying. So uh, it's really lovely for you to say that. I, I, I would say that, that that wasn't a conscious attempt on my part as much as, I guess, just a daily pursuit of me as a person um mm -hmm. to understand that and and not wish away the things that are are hard yeah now the thing is with that kind of unsentimental beauty is that it opens the door to wanting to discuss a little bit of your own background um let me just remind people you can watch this live on facebook watch it recorded afterward like it if you like it please and share it uh on youtube and twitter and all the other places um and then it will be a podcast and then we'll have links to Mackenzie's stuff everywhere within that so this is in conversation with Frank Schaefer and I am talking to my friend uh, Mackenzie Stubert about his album and we're playing some tracks off waiting room it will come out in the wind neck this coming winter um, we've already played one track never I know now Mackenzie, I happen to know that you and I share something in that we both come out of a sort of an evangelical type background. I left and I've written memoirs about it. I have a new book coming out, um, uh, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy, coming out November 2nd. My editor told me to write more about my background, to position the book. Uh, I keep trying in a way to escape that background and move on from it but obviously who we are is formed by where we come from. So I'm going to ask you a little bit, bring us up to speed on the journey that you had as a child, as a young man, growing up in a kind of a, a, an evangelical Christian fundamentalist type background, your journey from that, and then maybe how some of what you took with you from that still informs what you were own doing and what you were doing in view of your own spirituality today. Give us a little bit of that story. And I'm sorry to make you be biographical here, but I think yeah. it fleshes out who you are as a musician composer. Um, yeah, so I did, I grew up in a, a very evangelical environment, culture. It, it dictated uh, so much of my, my sense of reality. And was this your parents, the church you went to, all that stuff? My parents. And Homeschooling, church school, Christian school. I was homeschooled only for a short bit. And then when we uh, when there was a fourth brother in the in the in the mix, we moved out into the country where there was a, a small but robust public school. And, and so we you know, I joined public school by the by the second grade. And uh, but, you know, we still drove into town and went to church, you know, twice a week. And um, what sort of a church was that? So, you know, uh, I would say evolved from Baptist, non-denominational, fundamentalist, you know, Christian church. And just yeah. fast forward, are, are, are you still have family in that? Did other people leave? Or do you yeah, still have people in There's still some family members very much involved and then others that are, that are not. And we've all had various forms of conversation or not, as is the case with, with um, development and, and uh, evolution of, of thought and belief. Hmm. Um, I think when I first went to therapy, in my 20s and was dealing with the problem of pain. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that the solutions that um, I had been given were actually making everything worse and that you could understand where your pain comes from and move on from it. And it had nothing to do with a, uh, a spiritual battle over my existence. 
um, that was that was sort of the the real beginning of the end of that faith for me because mm -hmm. um, I found a more honest version of of living, even though there's there seems to be a lot less assurance, and I'm certainly more afraid of death than I used to be. Mm. Um, I seem to have exchanged the uh, peace that passeth understanding <laughs> for day-to-day -day living is easier, but overall existence is a bit more complex than it used to be. But that's yeah, when, when it's sort of open-ended and paradoxical and uncertainty plays a part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But um, I would say that the thing that we were talking about earlier about the um, pursuing this 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 beauty without sentimentality and pursuing the truth, I have been searching for what seemed like the truth and honesty. I've sometimes been nicknamed in my family the detective because I am trying to figure out what people are really thinking and feeling, what's going Speaking on. Speaking of which, during the Trump era, did you have discussions with some of the family where some of, did some of them go into the white nationalist Trump thing or is that a different kind of evangelical background? My immediate family didn't go full but there were there were some internal conflicts and some some you know party loyalties that were complex and it and it yeah. certainly put a strain and it and it it brought some discussions up and then it ended others but we have found a place of of peace within my immediate family mm. um, and then there are others from my past that I just haven't communicated much um, I know this is on Facebook Live but I deleted Facebook from my life a few years ago and that that simplified things yeah I understand that yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not to, when we get to your next cut, uh, which you call Ventamine. Is that Ventamine. Ventamine. At least that's what it sounds like when I read it off the page. I, I used to have this way of naming, because when you're dealing with instrumental pieces that are communicating something so abstract, yeah. where I'm not going in with an intention, I'm going in to discover something and mm -hmm. find out what it is that I'm even trying to express. And then I listen back as a listener saying, is there anything here? Yeah. Is there anything of myself in, in, in this? And so I will often look up uh, foreign translations of words and yeah. then break them apart or combine them. And, and I or make something up. So when we get to this song, what, how do you see it? What's it what is Ventamine about for you? Uh, it, it was inspired by the, uh, the French opera Lacme by Delib, his flower duet, which is this very close harmony sopranos singing together. And I loved the idea of, um, of a violin that actually had like two throats. Yeah. It could, it could actually sing two notes at once. And so instead of a, a duet that went like this, I wanted it. I, I imagine these birds that were able to um, perform in such close harmony that you would actually think they were one. Mm. And and I would say that the um, the experience of living with a creative person and the uh, representation of that empty chair mm. is very much about learning how to to do that sort of dance where the viewing of it is is as if it's one idea, even though it's two ideas working very, very hard to stay. You know. Yeah, I like that idea of a duet. You know, uh, a little while back, I interviewed the musician and also who's done some film scoring, Moby. And I was looking at his uh, movie he had made of his life. And I noted to him that, you know, generationally, uh, you know, I'm old enough so that during the high point of, of his, when a lot of more popular tunes and so forth were being made by him, um, I kind of missed the boat on that. But I discovered him later because I kept wondering why certain pieces of music in everything from the Bourne Conspiracy films to Heat were my favorite bits of the score. I always really do listen to the music. And it was like, I actually tracked him down thinking about that. And I wonder if in this album, Waiting Room, whether you're open to presenting this to some filmmakers where they can take some of these pieces as they are and incorporate them and or would you see those as points of departure where they come back to you and say, I would like you to score my film based on what I heard in this album mm -hmm. or would you like people to come to you and say, I would like to take this piece and put it in the movie as is. How do you talk about, what is that by the way? Uh, what, I, I know what scoring is, but when someone just picks up a piece like they did with some of Moby's stuff into yeah. the Bourne Conspiracy or Heat or these other movies, 
how does that work? They just come to say, hey, I'd like your song as my title track, or I want to put it in this particular scene because I think it fits. Does this happen? Yeah, it does. Let's let's be clear. Any modern composer or musician in a world in which the physical product is no longer connected to the means of selling and making a living. Right. Uh, we're interested in anything. Yes. <laughs> uh, now, there is a difference between synchronizing something like this yeah. uh, and putting it in context and finding a new context for what it is. Because if, you know, you your context was sitting uh, in your beautiful house uh, yeah. with, with uh, someone listening to this out of nowhere. So your context was what you were seeing, what you were feeling on that day. Yeah. And for someone to drop it into a film would be to create a new context, which is wonderful. But then there's the hiring me as a composer to write applied music, which I do every day. Yeah. Uh, I've scored a number of films. I, I write music every day for different clients. And that is creating something new for the project itself and listening to the director and listening to the project saying, what is this asking for? What does this need? Now, utilizing the techniques that I've developed that are unique to me, that that's certainly why someone would want to come talk to me versus maybe another composer. Yeah. Um, but to me, it's it's finding what what is needed. And for a film, hmm. music should be uh, an emotional parallel or counterpoint to what's happening. Yeah. Um, and and so those pieces that you love, it's because they provide that. Yeah, well, when I listen to your music, you know, there's some music that's more emotionally rich than other music. And for why, whatever reason, you, your music evokes something in me almost instantly where I feel like I am intruding on a story in the middle of it being told and immediately fascinated, but not quite know the beginning, middle and end. But the piece I'm listening to of the story just, you know, like walking past a room where someone's reading out loud and it's like, what are, what are they reading from it? Just draw, you know, being drawn in. mentioned the, the violin is being played by the wonderful Tim Fain, who um, basically, if you saw the film Moonlight, um, that's every violin that you hear in that every solo violin is, is him. And he's just a, a magnificent uh, player. 
who's performed with Philip Glass, among many others. And yeah, yeah he's just a really wonderful performer. Well, it's a very, very beautiful piece. And once again, you know, thinking of film score, but forget film score for a moment, just listening. You know, when I, when you sent me the album to listen to, um, I lay down on the floor, put it on the speakers and just listen from one end to the other, turned around from my wife, Jeannie had walked in and, and, and somehow started listening as well. And we were both very moved by the music, but also listened to it again, just for the pleasure of hearing it. Um, let's talk about the emotion there in your choice of instrument. There's the, there's the violin, but then what else is playing in that track? Um, I guess I, this is a wonderful moment to um, defend the modern way and digital tools, Frank, yeah. in making music, because this project wouldn't, wouldn't exist uh, without them, because yeah. I spend most of my time in front of a screen working with digital tools. And the challenge is to find a way of utilizing um, those tools, as well as anything else I can find, to present something that is uh, emotionally resonant and feels true, if that word can be used to mm. apply to such an abstract thing like music. Can I ask you a question though? Because there's something uh -huh. so different about your music. Why are you able to use these tools and still come away with the piece sounding not only organic, but so handmade and so unoverproduced, if I can use a terrible phrase? Well, that, because it sounds to me as if, you know, you're sitting in a theater watching a group of people play that. And I know you're using all sorts of bells and whistles and tricks, but it doesn't, there's none of that there. It's like watching, you know, CGI that's so good that it looks mm -hmm. real again. I mean, I, I, I don't know how to put this very well. I'm not a very techie person, but what the hell are you doing? Because it's not like anybody else's music that I know of right now. Uh, I think that, that has everything to do with whatever is at the center and at the center of these pieces uh, is a performance by a human mm -hmm. and and then how it's treated this particular the human being you and or your friend who's playing the violin. Yeah, but then the, the so-called bells and whistles, um, I think if you, if there is a, a, con a conceptual focus of how you use those tools mm. and that conceptual focus comes from a, a genuine idea. I think you're going to find something even in an entirely uh, electronic. I mean, I've been listening to a lot of electronic yeah. ambient music from Japan, and I find it deeply emotional, mm. even though it is incredibly technical and maybe even on a, a grid. Mm -hmm. And so the approach of this piece was, what if we had this duet? And then what if you could hear the ghosts of everyone who's ever played that violin mm. ever? And same with the piano, that when the musicians sit down to play these instruments, every time it off gasses the history and the emotion. Yeah. And you can hear almost like someone is playing a radio of everything that has ever been performed. And mm -hmm. then I look for that using the tools that I have. So that means sending the reverb channel of the violin into something else to create yeah. this spiraling, floating fairy dust something. Um, those are all attempts to describe what it is that I'm hearing. But what's so great about music is that I don't have to. I get to just do it hmm. until I'm satisfied. What, what's really rare about what you do, though, is that as someone who creates things myself, whether it's writing and learning to use, you know, the modern tools going from handwriting, which I wrote all my first three novels by longhand on yellow pads and my wife, Jeannie, typed them up. And then I decided to learn a keyboard. And now I did a lot of research on my new book that's coming out where I had to read scientific papers online and so forth. To me, the trick is always trying to make more look like less on anything. In other words, yeah, you've got the whole world at your fingertips and that's the problem because there's only so many hours in the day, but also how do you not go overboard? You know, it likes, it, it's sort of like effects in films. The, the very best ones are, the, are not the big explosions and all this stuff um, and making things fly. It's, it's, it's slightly modifying reality in a way that leaves you with something very organic that could have been made at any period of film history, but they're just choosing to do it this way. It doesn't wear it on its sleeve yeah. in some in your face way. Somehow your music to me is amazing because it, it, it's, it's organic and it reminds you of being in a theater in an old music hall, listening to those instruments being played. 
and that place has creaky floors and you even hear people sitting down and almost breathing next to you. You haven't taken this to a musical place, which is just the music. It's somehow located in, in your life, but also in, in time and space right here. You're not, you're not sort of ironing everything out. Like I said before, for lack of a better phrase, you know, you can almost hear the, the, the instruments breathing. And I think this piece as well, Ventamine had that in it. Um, really amazing, re, re, really, really amazing stuff. So now tell me what the reaction to this has been and tell me about this album deal you have, the kind of people you're working with, how they're going to bring this out. Um, what do you do to earn a living doing this in a day and age when everybody's stealing everything and nothing's for sale and, you know, you have to be touring in order to make it a musician? Are you, you know, falling back on scoring? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, products, I, I mean, talk about your life as a creative person on the practical side of how um, do you make this all work for yourself? I, uh, you know, every year is a different year and the relationships that I have slowly evolve. I do a lot yeah. of work for Netflix uh, in their internal uh, promotion department and I get the strangest jobs of, of writing music for trailers and other marketing materials where I, I actually get to put on an entirely different identity and I don't actually have to worry about being myself or communicating right. some greater truth. And as a crafts person, I, I enjoy that uh, much of the time. Um, and then I, you know, I spent the last year uh, with my wife creating a stop motion animated short film that we finally finished. That's going to be festivaling this year called Everybody Goes to the Hospital. And, and you I tell Tiffany to send me okay. a link to that because I, I've heard about this and seen bits, but I want to see it. So if it's done somewhere. Yeah, yeah, um, it'll be yeah, festivaling. I want to see it. I want to see it. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, How long yeah. is that stop rate? motion picture altogether it's quite short nine minutes and it took a year to do yeah okay yeah. there you are and the score utilizes a lot of the techniques that i've been developing over the last couple of years of of taking organic sounds and and using modern tools to find something else in them I, having gone to music school i was kind of chained to this idea of of the development of music through counterpoint and music theory and these different schools that mm -hmm. have evolved and and I found myself overwhelmed and lost of not being a part of any one of those schools. Yeah. And and as soon as I started to hear back something that I did not understand but I liked, I knew that I was heading somewhere. And I think that's all any artist can do is to find themselves a little confused but not unhappy about what it is that they're hearing or or seeing. Were work. you around while Tiffany was making this? Was she shooting it? Oh, we made it together. She wrote and directed it, and I was the producer uh, with uh, another fellow, Charlie Piper, and we worked with an animator and hired fabricators and designers, and uh, and um, and we were over at the animation studio every day for that's great six months, I think. So basically, because you were in it from the beginning, did the music begin to form as you worked on it? Or did you kind of wait to the end and do what people do and wait to see what you had? Or were you or were you animating to the music? We started early uh, because as I uh, live with someone who is my biggest fan. Yeah, who was has until you met me, who who watched me work with a lot of other directors. Yeah. And she couldn't wait to both set me loose, but also have control at the same time as a director. Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of fun exploring uh, because w we got to approach it in a different way where in this case, there was only two opinions that mattered. Right. Ours. And in most other situations, there are countless opinions that matter. I know that. And I'm wondering if you feel that you produce better music for this animated piece you made with Tiffany because you're in control or whether being forced to do something on commission for somebody else and still make it yours or make it good actually results in something better. Did you have too much freedom on this project and you're less happy with it than you thought you would be or is it the best thing you've ever done or where does it fall? Certainly some of them, my favorite music that I've written for film and I couldn't be more proud of the project itself Right. The experience was very unique. Um, and I think it actually, it has as much to do with the creative collaboration between the two of us as yeah. it is with the fact that she's just my favorite artist. So yeah. 
that's the way I feel with any artist. Remind me again of the title and where it's coming out because we're going to link to it so people can find it at some point. Uh, it's called Everybody Goes to the Hospital. And there's a teaser trailer out that I'll send you the link to so that people can see that right away. And where is that up on YouTube and places? Uh, yeah, I think everybody goes to the hospital.com or something similar. Okay, well, we'll we'll link to that. And there's a little bit of the music in that trailer. In the trailer, there's actually a piece of music from this cello project I did last year called Electro that I, I, I worked with a cellist, uh, Kaylee Drain, and did some experimentation of what would it be like to take only the recordings of a cello hmm. and see how far I could push that and, and make it sound like a pipe organ or make it sound like an orchestra. And I love that. I, and I love the way you use instruments. I just got to tell you, I think it's unique. Have other people commented on what I'm seeing in your music as in the unique flavor of the emotional quality of the, forget the music, yeah. but how you use the instruments. I love the music. I love the finished product, but how you use the instrument is so amazing. It's like you hear a piano in a way you've never heard a piano. You hear a violin in a way you've never heard a violin. You hear other sounds in there and you're asking yourself, what is that? Have other people commented on, on the quality of how you're using the instrument? Yeah, I, I've had a lot of questions of what is that when, yeah. it's, when it's the piano, because the piano is such a complicated, I mean, it is a percussion instrument. Sure. It has so many moving parts and things that are built to make the sound. And I think the, the effort that goes into making a single sound, hmm. and I guess what has happened is over time, all of those single sounds that are unified are actually kind of out of sync. Yes. And so instead of hearing one sound, you're hearing all of them together mm. because they're not where they're supposed to be. Yeah. And, and I think that's what kind of makes this uh, just unique and, and not sounding like a piano. But over the last 10 years, as, as um, recording at home has become uh, easier to do at a really high level, Sure. Um, composers like Nils Fromm, who you know recorded this wonderful album in his apartment, and he didn't want to disturb his neighbors, so he wrapped his piano in blankets, put felt over the keys, and played very quietly and turned the microphones way up. And uh, that was part of this sea change of how to approach recording, because we all respond. I mean, the same way that composers started writing an even sure. number of movements, because LPs required two sides. Yeah. Technology always adjusts how people approach their creativity. Sure. And of course it did when just when instruments were invented or evolved from a, you know, a spinet to a clavicure to a piano to and then <laughs> organs. And I mean, that's not a new phenomenon. No, no, it's it's been a, a constant part of development of music. And so we're just in we're we're just in now. And yeah, it now contains, it contains a lot of bedrooms and people who can't afford to go to recording studios or simply don't need to. Yes. Um, and at the same time, we're all looking for. Uh, I, I like in creating anything nowadays to looking out at a vast ocean and the ocean is created hmm. by creative content and you look out over the ocean and there are boats and there are ships. And yeah. everyone who's sitting on the shore with their new project puts their little paper boat on the water. And most of them just get uh, destroyed or, or absorbed into the ocean. And then every once in a while, you have a boat that floats. And we're all hoping that our boat floats. Yeah, well, yours is floating. And, oh, and you know, it, it's an intelligence test of the filmmaking, television making community out there, whether they pick up on your stuff in the way that it's quite obvious to anybody who listens to this, they should be. Um, and, you know, the album, I, I trust will ha meet every kind of success that you could hope for. I'm going to talk about the last track we're going to play, not because we'll play it right now, but I'd like to talk a little bit about further. Mm -hmm. Before we before we do, uh, I just want to remind people that you have been listening to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, that I'm talking to the musician, the composer, uh, Mackenzie Stubert and I guess I should Stubert, tell you, Stubert. Stubert for the sake of my well, family. It's your misfortune because you know Schubert. Sure, Stubert. I mean, like, like I'm I'm confusing you with another composer. Okay, Stubert. Um, but Mackenzie, uh, when when we play further, um, what are we going to be hearing? You're going to hear 
an evolution of a piece of music that had probably five incarnations and five different homes. I think the first version probably existed as I was trying to just find something. So what I would do as creative starts is take old animated films or silent films and I put them up on the screen and I just start writing music. And I, I had this footage of a, of a subway from Paris in the 19 teens, black and white footage. And I started writing it and then I had this harmonic progression. Hmm. And then I probably had a commercial job that I was like, oh, I kind of like that progression. And then I tried something. And then I encountered this uh, uh, filmmaker artist named Chris Milk, who brought me into this virtual reality world for a few years. And we did this piece called uh, The Evolution of Verse. Uh, and he was presenting this concept of, of what this development of art could be in a virtual reality space. And so I, I scored that film. And from that became the, the next version. And then I always liked some of this material and I, I knew that there was something else for it. And so I, I sat down and I continued to, to work it almost like a, a sculpture over mm. the years. Um, and a lot of composers have this where they're like, you know, it hasn't quite found its final form right yet and uh and then it turned into this very long piece and i kept trying to shorten it but it it just every time i would hear i was like no that's that's how long it seems well to when me. we get when we get to it we're going to play ourselves out on that so we'll get a good chunk of it in um before we get there let me just say that i'm um, participating in a porch course with gareth higgins my friend who founded the wild goose festival beginning mid-January, and it's based on my forthcoming new book, which will come out November 2nd, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy, which, by the way, your lovely, beautiful partner and wife, Tiffany, contributed to so beautifully by reading it and making notes and endorsing it and doing all sorts of great things. Oh, big shout out to Tiffany again. Um, and by the way, nobody will be turned away from the porch curse for a lack of resources. So, you know, it, it's it's not something you've got to worry about from the financial point of view. Um, and it'll be live and discussions with me and with Gareth and with other people and then available later. So please visit the porchcourses.com to become part of this. Uh, you have plenty of time and, and get my new book. In the meantime, pre-order it uh, if you can from Amazon and maybe read it um, before we do the porch course so you come informed and can ask questions and all the rest of it. So let me get back now uh, to Mackenzie and again, talk about his album, Waiting Room, which will come out this winter. We've played three tracks. Well, we played two, we're gonna play a third. Ne I, I Never I Know, Ventamine, and Further. We've been talking about Further and we'll play ourselves out uh, in a couple of minutes um, with that. Before we Before we get to that, in the best of all worlds, a few years from now, what would you be doing, if anything different? Would you be making another movie with Mackenzie? Would you be scoring a movie uh, for a series for TV? Would you be doing more of the same? If you could just push a button and line things up a little better for yourself, what would it be? Uh, it's, I, I'm glad you asked, because it's really important for people to just state exactly what it is that they want. Yeah. So, in a couple of years. Uh, or now or next month, yeah, what do you yeah. want? Uh, I, I'm also in the process of starting my own small label because I have a lot of music to make that I want to just be able to put out into the world when I want to put it out. Yeah. And so that the people who like what I do would I'll always be able to find it. And, and I could control that means because what does a label do? They distribute music of an artist. And when uh, is that going to happen? And what is it? That I've already written uh, the first album for that project uh, that will launch either at the end of this year before Waiting Room comes out or early next year. I'm not quite sure yet. I'm, I'm what's that? What, what's the project? I mean, not the project, but what is the label going to be called? That's a good question. Uh, I, I'm seeking for a, a name right now. So if you okay. have a recommendation, although it'll probably be be me taking a, a, a word or a feeling and translate it into a foreign language and then mistranslating it back. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, uh, and is the album, is the album you're going to release through that label uh, similar in any way to um, what we've been listening to today, or is it something completely different? Oh, it's actually uh, uh, an electronic, I call it melodic ambient, but every time I listen to it, it's a lot more melodic than it is ambient. Yeah. Um, 
it's almost as if you took the the instrumentation of a Brian Eno album and you added a lot more form and and melody to it. I really want to hear that. So when are, when well, are we going to be able to hear this? Uh, well, you'll get to hear it pretty soon, and then okay. I'll I'll, I'll uh, probably by the end of this year. And when uh, waiting when Rating Room comes out and or that album comes out, let's do another one of these so that we can have the luxury of giving people something to click on and get it, yeah. rather than like next year or the winter. You know, I've been frustrated with my new book, November second. Okay, great, but like, how about right now? Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, um, and then uh, I I aim to be still producing projects with with Tiffany and yeah. uh, and as I encounter more wonderful directors building a few very specific uh, collaborative relationships uh, in film because as the film industry has changed hmm. you know I I'm I'm interested in doing less and and being more specific because I like being a composer but I also love yeah. being outside and I'm finding myself more and more looking for any opportunity to not be a composer in my life. And as I've done that, I've found myself feeling better at being a composer. What, what movies have you watched in the last 10 years where you might have liked the score or not liked the score, but you liked the movie and you're saying, wow, you know, I could I could have done something with that um, in terms of the kind of films you've watched. Mm. You know, I have ideas about where your music that I've heard so far would fit very well or the type of film. I'm just wondering if you've and of course, then there's the counterintuitive kind of ironic use of the music where you have a, you know, that you have the, the, your sound over something that's counterintuitive and that works very well because it's not what you would expect there. So yeah. it can be all sorts of stuff. Yeah. I, Does I, mind? I don't, I actually don't think about films that way in terms of, oh, I could have scored that. And uh, actually yeah. out of, I have a profound respect for my fellow composers. I'm asking more what kind of movies you like, as in oh. just you enjoy. I enjoy all sorts of different films. Uh, you know, whether I can picture myself having been part of the process, writing a screenplay, whatever. But I'm just wondering oh. the kind of films that you gravitate to as a filmmaker yourself. Sure. I think I gravitate towards the films that are exploring what it means to be a human being mm -hmm. and doing that as honestly as possible, whether that is a phantom thread or you, yes. were, or you were never really here or, yeah, yeah, or something. Yeah. I mean, it, Inside Lewin Davis is one of my favorite. I would actually could put that on a double bill with Phantom Thread about the difficulty of being an artist and being in a relationship with an artist. Yes. Because when I first saw Inside Lewin Davis, I thought, oh, this poor artist who, who has a really difficult time connecting emotionally with people one-on-one -on -one, as well as an audience with his work. And then over the years, I found myself connecting to his experience way more than I felt comfortable admitting yeah. upon the first viewing. Well, uh, Phantom Thread is a film that I that I bought because I wanted to keep watching it. And um, I love it. Jeannie and I watched it several, numerous times. Actually, it's one of those movies that I just watch as kind of something to you know touch base with. It's just really w well done. I mean, it's uplifting in the sense that it's so good. Mm -hmm. And so unexpected in some ways. It's just the first time you watch it, you're saying, okay, I'll have to watch it again. So I'm not just so blown away by everything and can there's figure it out. About, there's something intoxicating about the the uh, the idealized selfish life as an artist. Yeah. And and how difficult it is to have that selfishness that can yeah. be needed and that ego that is needed to create something and say, hey guys, this is me. You should listen to this. Yeah. And have something to give to mm -hmm. someone else in your life and to love them uh, and empathize with them. Yeah. Switching back and forth between those things can just about kill you. Yes. Phantom Fred is a really great film. And I'm glad you bring that up because it's exactly <laughs> the kind of movie I want to see you scoring. <laughs> um, in any, not that you put it that way, but I do. I've made the, I've made the leap. It's a, it's a great film. Um, so when, tell us again when the animated picture uh, comes out. Uh, well, it's been submitted to some festivals, so I hope it premieres at either Sundance or Berlin All. But we'll keep you posted. At the yeah. least, it'll it'll it will be playing in the next year and eventually make its way online, probably in about a year. And but, the album uh, "Waiting Room" available. Give me a month or a date or sometime. I, I, that has not been pinned down. All I can say is early 2022, but I will be giving you that info as soon. So are you as thinking possible. sort of January, February, March, April kind of times, or January, February, somewhere in there, hopefully. Yeah, 
yeah, that's that's the, that's the goal. Any of these cuts available anywhere now where anybody can there, go on to YouTube? A, you can go to Spotify and you can hear a, a track that we did not play today called Respire. Which, which I love. Yeah, by the way, great that, track. That, that's available now. And you can hear the score that I did for the documentary about Elian Gonzalez uh, called Elian. And then the, and can uh, we link? Can you give us all those links so Ernie can put that all up with everywhere? Yeah, yeah. And then the Electro project, uh, the, the two EPs for that are available now and you can you can listen. Yeah, to because it. everybody's going to want to listen to that stuff and we will link to everything. All right. So we are going to uh, stop talking now. And we're going to play ourselves out with further. Uh, we have about five minutes left and Ernie will try his fade down again. And Mackenzie, I just want to thank you for taking this time with me. Give my best to Tiffany. Um, I hope that the right kind of people, a few people are listening. We will share this with people. I have some friends who do things that I want to share this with and just urge everybody to follow Mackenzie's work. Um, if, if I know anything about anything about anything in, in the 60 odd years that I've been involved with doing creative things since childhood, Mackenzie's someone you're going to hear a lot about um, in connection with his music, his work, his composing and all the rest of it. So keep track of Mackenzie. Thank you, Frank. Important, uh, important person. Every, every artist needs an advocate. And so it's, it's meaningful that you're such a wonderful advocate for, for the art that you love. Well, you're, put it this way, I'm an advocate for art I love, but really genuinely, seriously on a top 10 list, you're, you're right there. So I just think you're terrific. And I love, I love your work, Mackenzie. I love your work. Thank you. So Ernie, play us out. Mm -hmm.